Welcome to What's Next, Living Longer, Better, Smarter. We really appreciate you taking the time to join us. I'm Fred Fishkin, along with Mary Furlong. I've been reporting on consumer tech as a journalist for years and years, and Mary is an author, professor, serial entrepreneur, and a leading authority on the longevity marketplace and the creator of the What's Next events. Hi, Mary. Hi, Fred. Great to be here. Sure is. Our focus is on the intersection of technology, longevity, and aging. Hence the name, Living Longer, Better, Smarter. And it turns out the timing of our inaugural episode comes with the title, Gail Sheehy, A Reporter's Life Well Lived. And Mary, we have some wonderful guests here with us, Sherry Snelling and C.G. Ware. Sherry is a corporate gerontologist and founder and CEO of the Caregiving Club. She's the author of A Cast of Caregivers, Celebrity Stories to Help You Prepare to Care. C.G. is a New York Times and USA Today bestselling author of 12 novels and two nonfiction works, including Right Sizing Your Life. She's also an Emmy Award-winning television producer and has a wonderful extensive broadcast and print journalism career as well. And what Mary, C.G., and Sherry have in common are friendships with Gail Sheehy, the journalist and author who died from pneumonia complications on August 24th. Mary, maybe you should lead off with, with a little more about Gail. So we're here to talk about the amazing work of Gail, um, who was really the leading authority of adult life development and the author of 17 books, including Passages, Men's Passages, and the one that I'm most familiar with, The Passages of Caregiving. Um, she was in the process of writing a book on millennials, which we'll hear a little bit about. And um, right before we lost Gail, my sister brought over the ARP magazine. And in it, there was this wonderful story about Gail walking in the park in New York uh, with her dog and talking about what life was like during the time of COVID. And I was so excited for her that her voice was still present in this magazine that reaches 38 million people. Uh, and so Gail had been a frequent keynote speaker at our What's Next conferences. And so when we were all uh, surprised and shocked by her loss, um, some of her friends got together and said, let's talk about her work, because her work had such an important role in our life. It, 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 we were very influenced by her ideas. So CG, share your thoughts about this, because in many ways, you knew Gail the longest and the best. Yes, you know, I was thinking back, I met Gail in 1975. We were basically cub reporters. Well, I was, she wasn't. She had, she was five years older than I was. And I've known her for 45 years. And so the loss was so sudden and so shocking. And it really caused me to think back that, you know, when I first met her, she was already an established reporter and a writer. Uh, but the whole world of new journalism was just really beginning to, to be prominent in American culture. And she was one, usually the only woman in the, war, in the room. And I was often the only woman in the room when I was, I was in broadcasting when I first met her. But through her and uh, Clay Felker, the man she eventually married, I got a chance to be a print reporter. So in, in, in a huge way, Gail launched my career in a way. But the thing that struck me about Gail was her insatiable curiosity, which led her to sort of think about, she had a child and about the stages of infant and toddler and preteen and teen and young adult. And she saw the linkages in her own curious way between that and the normal transitions of adulthood, which we never thought about as a culture. You know, you thought, oh, well, you're 21 and that's it. Gail always looked deeper. She mm -hmm. drilled down and she connected with everyone who would know anything about a subject she was mm -hmm. interested in. Mm -hmm. And that to me was what she, her genius was. And she drew that comparison between the predictable stages of childhood and saw us as adults going through, you know, the 30s and the 50s and the midlife crisis. She coined the word midlife crisis. So she really is, is a cultural uh, figure in, in the 20th and 21st century up until the day 
she passed away. And I think that she took and applied that concept to so many other subjects, as Mary just mentioned, you know, men's passages and caregiving as a passage. And so uh, when I was um, beginning to write for print, as opposed to moving out of, of on, on camera journalism, I suddenly realized that, you know, I was moving from a bigger house to really small quarters up in San Francisco where there was no room at the inn during the dot-com thing. And I realized I was going through the passage of downsizing physically with my possessions and my life. My kid was grown. Uh, we were empty nesters. The dog had died, you know, that I was going through this, this passage and wrote the book, Right Sizing Your Life, about simplifying your life as you get older to kind of suit the age and stage you're in. So without Gail, I'm sure I never would have even had the thought that, wow, this is happening and this is a stage. So she was a trailblazer in so many ways. And she looked at the inner life and the psychology of everyday events. And, and, and that's really, for me, looking back, I didn't realize it at the time, but looking back, I realized that for me, and I think for the culture, was her impact. Yes, she had almost an anthropologist uh, zeal and zest to go in and understand something. I remember when she came to San Francisco and met with the Family Caregiver Alliance as she was beginning to figure out what is this whole topic called caregiving. She knew she was a caregiver, but as you say, she was a little older than we were, taking care of someone who was quite a bit older than she was. was and she got to see all these different stages. And in her book, she writes with such scenes that you could see her taking him out of the hospital, or you could see them in Paris where she mixed his food for dinner and have that served and how she even went to Paris uh, at that stage. And up until the, the end when they were at Lincoln Center listening to music, so she really understood and helped us understand that caregiving doesn't happen in one day. It might happen in two decades. And what happens, why you need a medical quarterback as a caregiver. And I remember when she took a group of experts in aging to Grace Cathedral and she walked around the labyrinth outside labyrinth, the yeah. cathedral. And she said that caregiving is a labyrinth. But Sherry, you know so much about this as a gerontologist. Tell us what role Gail's work had in the field of gerontology. Sure, I'd like to first start, Mary, with um, just following up on what you and, and CG just said. And, and one of the things I think that struck me about Gail's writing is that it wasn't just you know, insightful and really painted a picture and told great stories. But I think what was so powerful is that each of us could see ourselves in what she was writing. And she had that connection, I think, with her reader that really did make her a, a, a superb and powerful um, writer. But I, I met Gail um, when her husband Clay was in palliative care. But it was a few months actually before he passed and I was um, working for a very large um, healthcare company at the time and she was reaching out to different people to get more insights and got connected to me and I was thrilled because I knew her writing mostly from her magazine writing and Vanity Fair and several other places. I hadn't yet read her book, Passages. I was in my mid to late 40s at the time. And um, so anyway, we had such a great conversation on the phone and she was kind of a hero of mine. So I concocted a business trip to New York City so that I could meet her in person because she said, well, if you're ever in New York, look me up. And I said, oh, I'm actually going to be there next week. And then, you know, I immediately was calling my boss, you know, hey, I think I need to go to New York and do all this stuff. And then I read her book, Passages on the Plane. And I think, so for me, what was really so interesting is that as a woman who was at a crossroads in her career, I really wasn't happy with what I was doing. I had certain passions. I felt like I'm not really pursuing what I really love. I also had some love relationship issues. So her book really struck me. And when we got together and she was so gracious and invited me to her apartment on the Upper West Side and cooked me quiche and we had a couple glasses of wine and then we went for a walk in Central Park. We just had this bonding and, and throughout our conversation, which really started around caregiving, 
and her wanting to understand this world and who who were the experts and you know what did she need to know um we really then created a different kind of relationship talking about our childhoods and who had really been our heroes in childhood and 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 all these other things so from a that was a personal perspective from a gerontologist perspective i think what was so fascinating about what gail did and you touched on it mary she her mentor was Margaret Mead when she was in school in New York, uh, who was a famed anthropologist. And Gail really became that social anthropologist, I think, for all of us in her writing. But she really had, um, in passages, she started to touch upon what we in gerontology um, know is Eric Erickson's eight stages of development. And, um, and, and some other themes as well that really gerontologists study. But for me, what was really fascinating about Gail going back and, and knowing, knowing as I got trained in gerontology is that there is the seventh stage of development where you can go one of two ways. One is gerontivity, which is definitely what Gail had, or stagnation, which she definitely did not have. But gerontivity is about giving back. It's about having had life experience, have wisdom, and then sharing it with others that you can pass it on to, and really filling that mentor role. And so just organically, um, she just became a great mentor to me. And then, of course, um, you know, throughout the years we obviously stayed in touch and you know every time I was in New York I we tried to get together and, and all of that. The other thing too is I think that um, when Gail wrote her book Passages in, in Caregiving um, she again came up with such great words. She was the very first person to use the terminology the new normal which now we, we evoke for everything right but she coined that phrase and I think it was so beautiful to conceive of you have a life through caregiving and then you have a life after caregiving and and gail really did tell the spectrum of the caregiving story and not just focus on the person receiving the care but also the caregiver and then what happens once you lose your loved one so she was she was really the, the first you know famed writer to write about hospice and palliative care end of life and what happens after your loved one passes which i think was so profound for this particular industry I think she also, um, when you look at lots of investors and entrepreneurs and people have incidences related to caregiving, but it wasn't just her story of I, a caregiver, she really created this model to think through the stages. And so it's that heuristic model that sets her, I think, a step, a step, a step above. Um, so it's in this time of COVID, it's never easy to lose a friend. It's never easy to lose a friend. And also we hardly see our professional friends except on Zoom calls. And so we felt compelled to come together and to seek some support from each other in just sharing some traits that we saw in Gail as an advocate for women, as a leader and um, so, share a story with us that tells us a little bit about Gail as a person and all the fun we had because we really had fun and we went to some amazing parties <laughs> together. So CG, over to you. I know you all shared music in common. Right? Well, we shared a lot. And it's interesting because I was thinking, you know, preparing for this about my relationship with Gail, Gail in the beginning was one about work, was about, you know, doing the work and the only woman in the room and how are we going to make our deadlines and all of that. Um, and I realized that, you know, because she was that five years ahead of me, she was really a cheerleader and so much fun. And we would do these crazy things. And we were, you know, we both had young children at the time when we met. We both had husbands that we were juggling and we were professional women. So my first half of my friendship with her was really professional. And then as we got to know each other, we realized we had so much in common. And she was that bit ahead of me that she was really generous. And as we all know about the queen bee syndrome, Gail really didn't have it. She was working her her heart out and she was willing to share 
her ups and downs. And she was the most honest person about when she failed and when it didn't work out and what she could learn and what I could learn because of what she did. And that was an amazing thing. But the fun we had was that we loved, well, we loved theater. She loved jazz, which I like, okay. But we loved musicals. And we would, I would come to New York, I live in San Francisco. And I made a lot of trips to New York because my, my grown son was in New York. And we would get together and I'd say, well, what musical? She says, oh, we're too late to get any of the good ones. Let's go see Razzle Dazzle, which wasn't a big hit, you know. And we would get the nosebleed seeds because we were not about to pay $200 for, you know, a so-so musical. But we didn't care. And we would go up and we'd sit literally above the clouds and watch these musicals. And we loved it. We had so much fun with that. And of course, uh, as with Sherry, we share our Cavalier King Charles Spaniels. But as, a, as, as she would say, dogs are really important in learning to be kind and unconditional and be there for somebody. And I think this dog thing sounds trivial, but it wasn't. And it's interesting that the last piece she wrote was about Charlie being her companion and keeping her sane during COVID. And interestingly, my dog I got later and I said, can I, I can't think of a name and I love Charlie Knickerbocker because he, he was a journalist in the 20s and 30s. I said, can I name my dog Charlie West? So we had the same dog, same color dog with the same name. And that was Gail. She was so generous. She would let me even take her dog's name to name my dog. <laughs> So our life was really professional in the beginning, but a, a very deep friendship because she always extended a hand to me and wanted to know what I was doing. And she was curious about what I was doing. She was always one of the great listeners. And as Sherry said, when she didn't know something, she went straight to the top experts. I mean, that's why she, her content was so great. She would keep going, make the next call, make the next call, make the next call until she really understood it in an anthropological way that I honestly think Margaret Mead uh, really, you know, set the, set the tone for what she learned to do. And uh, then she taught the rest of us. Sure, uh, CG, uh, maybe you can uh, explain a little bit. One of the things that, that Gail did from what I understand was not accept the role that was assigned to her of staying on the women's pages in in the papers. She just barged through the door and and did it her way. How how did she accomplish that? She was just an Irish firecracker. I mean, I'm telling you. I, in fact, she told me a story that she came to a meeting breastfeeding her daughter, which just set the men you know on edge. And when I had my son, I went to the polo lounge and breastfed him because I thought, well, if Gail can do it, I can do it. She just had a kind of fire in her belly where she didn't accept the normal. And she really was pushing for a new normal that included women and that she felt she had the ability, although she had a lot of, it's interesting because her relationship with uh, Clay Felker, who was originally her editor and later her husband, she was full of uncertainty, but that never stopped her. It was like, I'm afraid, but I'm going to do it anyway. And she taught me that. I'm afraid, it's scary, but I'm going to do it anyway. And that was her talent. She just had tremendous courage. And it was Margaret Mead, to some extent, who uh, her words that uh, got her to go wherever the action was. More I or think less. It, well, it, was, it was her, but it was actually Gail's in, essential quality because she went to Columbia late in, later in life. I mean, she didn't go as a young woman. She went as a you know, woman in her thirties, I think. Um, and, and she went after, she wanted to know what Margaret Mead knew. You know, so it was this curiosity that is, and I think that's what journalism is. You have to have this basic, I don't know this and I want to know it. And I think that Gail just had it in space where well, she, 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 never got, she never got bored. She wanted to know what's going on. And I think Clay was also her mentor, who was yeah. one of the, the top editors in the country. He gave us a chance. Right. He was a guy who didn't accept the normal either. I mean, he was a guy from the Midwest who came to New York with stars in his eyes and loved everything. And he was very much of that same ilk. Um, but he, 
he was sort of an early feminist because he gave a lot of women on his magazines, which was New York, New West, and he had the original New York magazine right, right. In, in the newspaper. Uh, but he gave a lot of women when I was starting to do print because I'd been a broadcaster. Um, you know, he gave me my first chance. I, I wrote a, a column called Consumer Aware because my name was C.G. Ware and they, you know, he, that was it. And, and you know, and I, I'd never written for print. I'd only written radio and television. Um, but he gave a lot of women um, a chance and he was her mentor. And man, they had their sessions sometimes when they didn't agree on stuff. But he, he, he opened a door and there's just no denying that. So I was the lead act for uh, Gail's three-year book tour. Uh, and I was the opening act and uh, invariably she would come right at the last moment, but that was because she was editing her notes right up until she was on stage. And so, you know, um, but I learned from her how to make those words count, how to, how to have not only the ideas and the insights, but to make it feel like icing on a cake. And so, Sherry, talk about Gail, what you learned from Gail as a writer and as a storyteller. Sure. And, and again, just following up on what CG said, I think she was absolutely fearless, right? I mean, there, there were no boundaries in terms of her wanting to learn. And I think part of this whole aging process and life course learning is that lifelong learning that she had that passion. And so from, from a writer's perspective, what I observed with Gail is she was a great listener. And I think so often, even in business relationships, we forget to listen. You know, we want to talk, we want to share, we want to say, well, I think this, or I think that, and we forget to listen. And Gail was a fantastic listener. And I think you can't be a good writer without being a great listener. And then again, she was so curious about everything. Um, I also, again, just want to reflect on what CG said. She was really a cheerleader for me as well. I, when I had this whole epiphany on the plane after reading her book that I wasn't happy and I needed to make a shift and what I really wanted to do was be a writer. Um, she was a real champion for me. I mean, she said, do it, you know? And I said, well, I've always wanted to write a book. And she's like, go for it. And I would share my notes with her. So she really did have that that sense of being a, a, an advocate, I think, uh, for other women and, and other, you know, just others in her life, which was so phenomenal. Um, the one thing that she turned me on to um, as we kind of continued in our friendship was the, um, I'm, I'm a type A personality. I can't relax for anything. I mean, yoga, I'm, you know, I'm thinking about all the things I have to do. I'm not breathing right. Um, and she turned me on to the Herbert Benson relaxation response because when she and Clay, who was going through treatment when they lived in Boston, um, Herbert Benson was a famous professor from Harvard who started the Mind Body Institute. And he talked about you know, doing 10 minutes of just this relaxation exercise in the morning and 10 minutes again at night can really solve a lot of our, our pains and our ills and our headaches and our tension and our stress and all that. So, so she just shared so much. And again, I think, you know, we all could reflect that back into um, who we became as writers. But I, I think the best lesson I learned from her is you know, because I was curious as well, but being a good listener was great. The other thing that I just wanted to share, because I thought it was, it was one of the things that I think bonded Gail and I from the very beginning, that first lunch that we had at her apartment, we just started talking about our lives. And we both realized that our grandmothers had great influence in who we probably became and where our passions really lied. And she had told me a story about her grandmother had given her her first typewriter and had kind of supported her in venturing out into New York City and, and when she was a very young girl and uh, you know capturing the stories of the city. And my grandmother gave me her typewriter, her royal typewriter from the 1920s and 30s when she was writing short stories. So, so just little things like that, understanding the sensibilities of what binds us together, I think was so great um, that I, I got with my friendship with Gail. And it was really, it was really precious to me. So she made all of us want to up our game. And uh, when we went to First Republic Bank, um, she had their new book out and 
we talked to Gigi Cabersi, one of the branch managers in Los Altos. And Gigi plays top of game. And uh, so when Gigi read the book, she reached out to all of her client base who then brought their friends to the bank. But given the last scene in the book was Gail and Clay at Lincoln Center, Gigi hired a band to be in this branch in the First Republic branch. So I was there, opened it up. People couldn't wait to have her sign the book, tell her their caregiving story. And then we went to the other side of the bank, left the conference room, and this band was playing jazz and Gail was dancing in the bank. And I thought, this is so great. When was the last time you saw a jazz band in a bank? I, you were, Fred and I worked together 30 years ago, so this is our first podcast. We're so excited to be doing this. And um, you were in jazz in New York as well, right? Well, more or less. I mean, her love of jazz is, is, is great to hear. One of my first jobs in radio was, well, it wasn't the first, but one of them was uh, as news director for WBGO Jazz 88. It was back in the late 70s, just a wonderful station that has grown into one of the jazz destinations in radio, one of the great ones. And because everything's on the internet now, it's global, <laughs> their, their reach as a jazz station. It was and is an NPR station. And I just bet uh, Gail was one of the many supporters of the station. I, I would bet that. And today I've got a, a grandson who's an aspiring jazz musician. So everything goes round and round, doesn't it? Um, so uh, Gail and I had similar coloring, I think, to you too, CG. So we'd often dress alike and have to color. You have to have your color. <laughs> <laughs> but um, one time when we were at, in Chicago on stage, uh, Gail was our keynote, and she keynoted many conferences. And I've heard from people all over the country even around the world this week, who have a memory to share and how influential she's been. But um, at the time she was talking about, she was about my age, it's about 10 years ago, and she was talking about what roles we have as older women. And so Fred, to the theme of learning longer, better, smarter, she was saying, she really paused and you could hear a pin drop in the audience and she said, I want to be, ta I'm taking on new roles. And I could see her almost reflecting to herself. And she said, I want to be really great as a mother-in-law. I want to be great as a grandmother. And I want to be great as a mentor. So in some ways, I I'll never forget that line because there aren't a lot of people who tell us Here's what you should be great at at the next phase. As our life in this third age, we don't have guidance counselors that we go and talk to. We kind of reach out to each other. And, the, and so she, she shared that insight. And I never know, so many things are shared at events, now virtual events, but I really kept that phrase. So uh, Sherry, she was a mentor to you too, right? She was, and it's it's so um, interesting that you bring that up, Mary, because I was at that conference that you're talking about, and I remember after she spoke, saying to her later, you know, you are a great mentor, because you've been a great mentor to me, and I, I think, I wish I had expanded on that, though. As I was writing some notes for this podcast, I thought, you know, one of the things we need to do is tell people more what they mean to us when they're when they're right there in front of us instead of maybe after we've lost them like this although i'm i'm so happy to to be venerating her and, and celebrating her. But um, she was a mentor. And I, and I want to also touch on something is that, you know, it's so interesting because right now in in our you know area of studying aging, you know, we're doing a lot of discussions around ageism and you know the the issues around, you know, um, looking at different age groups and, and and things and you know assigning them certain you know stigma or whatever and i think that gail was again an early pioneer in really pushing back on that ageism even though we didn't probably call it ageism so much back then but you know i mean uh, cg i know you're gonna tell us uh, a little bit about um, <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, about, you know, the millennials that she was working with. But also, she didn't see, I mean, aging for her, she was ageless, right? I mean, she herself was ageless. And I don't think that she saw a number of, you know, on your birthday as being what you should be doing. It wasn't about the social norms. It was about almost busting those social norms and really thinking about how to live your life fully. And I, for me, again, she was a mentor. And as you said at the top of this podcast, Mary, she continues to be a mentor because I thought about losing her. And I thought, but hearing the story from CG that we'll hear about, you know, her last days, her, she lived life right up until the end fully and, and, and passionately. And I think that those are the things that I think most about with Gail. And so from a mentor standpoint, I think to myself, that's how I want to do it. You know, I want to be Gail's age and sitting down with whatever generation it will be calling them at that time and learning more about all of these things and continuing to be curious about life and, and people and friendships and girlfriends and all of that. I think, you know, it's interesting. Gail didn't shy away from problems and what was going on. I mean, I have two really sort of strong thoughts about that is that she was, and we both had talked about she was pushing back on ageism. Mm -hmm. And I don't think she'd mind my saying that, you know, as she got older, it was getting harder to make the sale, to get the book deal, to get into the New York Times and the Washington Post. And, but the thing that was great about her, she didn't care. She just kept doing her work. And if she sold it to Politico for $400, she did it. If she, you know, whatever she did, she just kept going. And I think she was very aware of ageism, as, as all of us are, as we, you get older and you still have the energy to be a pro, to be a professional. And, and, um, and uh, so she understood it and was grappling with it. But her response was, can't keep a good girl down. And right. her response was, go, go, and keep doing it till you fall off the perch, which is basically kind of what happened. And the other thought I was thinking about what Mary was saying was about her desire. And we talked about this. What do you want to be as you get older? And she said, I want to be a better grandmother. And the fact was, she knew as a working mother, and I felt the same, that did we shortchange our own children? And that in a way, it was makeup time, a little bit. There was a little bit of that. If I can be a good grandmother, it's a gift to the daughter that I left with the babysitters when I went to do the big show or write the big piece or make the big deadline. And so I think as she got older, she, she was recognizing some of her flaws or, or shortcomings and that life never stops changing and we have to meet it and, and do our best and make amends in some ways. Uh, and I think that Gail was very, very aware of that. And, you know, she wrote the foreword to my book and she wrote it at a time of great distress. She was selling a house. Clay wasn't well. She just buried her soul in that. And that was her other great gift. She shared herself with, you know, Sherry and me and Mary and Fred, you know, she shared herself and she didn't, she didn't make it all look perfect. You know, she kind of was really honest about things. And we, and I think, I'm sure you did the same for her. We helped each other. She wrote my foreword, but one time she was in a terrible deadline with the, one of her last books, Daring. And she had to sort out all these photographs and she really was just exhausted. So I got on a plane, went back. We spent a week going through piles and piles of photographs from her whole life because it was an autobiographical book. And, you know, I helped her curate them, sort them out. So she was also ex able to accept help as well as offer it. And she was a pretty complete person, but she was aware of flaws in her own self. She really was. You know, mm -hmm. CG, she really opened up to, to all of us in that book, Daring, My Passages, the memoir. Uh, but there were many sides to her in her writing, it, you know, she, politics, so, so many things that, that she took on. Any favorites? 
that, that come to mind that, that each of you maybe want to mention? Mary? Well, I'll, or, I'll just or, share just Mary? really quickly what, what I thought, and again, it, it was later in her life, you know, she was a, a well-noted author and writer and had, you know, scaled the heights of, of journalism, but um, she had written a play called Chasing the Tiger, which was about the relationship that she had with Clay, and as CG noted, it was very, you know, <laughs> it was tumultuous at times, but tumultuous. deep, deep, deep. Yes, and, and passion, right? Full, full of passion. And, um, and, and I remember once when I was in New York, and she said, oh, I've got something special if you want to come with me. And we went to this little studio, and she had some actors who were reading the script, but she had become a playwright later in her life. So again, she was always pushing the boundaries of great writing and, 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 and impacting people. And I think, so I think, you know, again, it was such a great lesson to see her never stop, you know, exploring where she could have that influence or, or help people. You know, I was invited to her apartment to listen to that play. And it was in the early stages of writing. And I remember sitting there and I just love the way she wrote in scenes. And I would say the same thing in passages of caregiving, because you might remember the concept or the idea, but I loved the scenes and I'll, ne and I'll never forget that. I could see her as a copywriter, how she started in the women's section and I could see that newsroom. And so we love that. And of course, CG, a lot of the things you're touching on have a much broader uh, understanding because many women went to work for the first time and had to travel and were making their bones in the corporate world and were wondering how they could do it all, right? And Absolutely. so now in time of COVID, they're home learning how to be... Um, homeschool teachers of third graders, learning the new math. And um, a lot of people are rethinking the passages of their own life. And so I've had people say to me this week, I'm going to get that book. I read it with my mother when I was young. I'm going to reread it now because we're in maybe she might write crisis passage, you know, that this is a time when every institution, the health, the financial, the small business, the restaurant um, are being rethought. But I love the way that both of you are touching on, she let her future be really important. You know, there was a line at the White House Conference on Aging that said older adults need a vision of the future, not a memory of the past. So in some ways, to answer your qu question, Fred, about what, what piece of writing had the most impact, I think the piece that was in the AARP magazine, because in that piece, she talked about what was it like to be single in New York with a puppy, with your dog, and how are you navigating through this? And so that voice touched a lot of people who are trying to figure it out right now. Um, and I think that in this session here, we're reaching out to each other as colleagues and friends because we wanna keep that encouragement going. Um, so CG, more thoughts about the last week. And I think it makes everyone feel better to know that Gail had a very vibrant, uh, productive, fun last week you know oh, yeah she she's so funny because um during covid you know we we i don't think i did a zoom with her but we we emailed back and forth and we sent pictures um of, of what's going on in our life and our grandkids and, and uh, everything and so i i looked it up and on august 15th which wasn't that long ago she sent me this fabulous picture she had a bow named Robert, who was 93. And he had been a very distinguished um, editor and um, created People Magazine. And he was a very amazing man. I met him a number of times. And um, they, he had a place out in Sag Harbor with his son. And so Gail was invited out. And she sent me this picture of Robert and her sitting in beach chairs on the beach. And I thought, that's Gail, you know, she's at Sag Harbor. She's not going to miss not going to the beach, right? And apparently um, 
what I learned, uh, so that was the last contact I had with her. We exchanged pictures and what's going on with us. And I'm working on a book. She's working on the book. And, and the other thing, the last time I actually physically saw her was just about a year ago when I was in New York. And I walked into the apartment and there was her dining table with about five millennial youngsters to us youngsters that she had engaged as interns and she was working on this book about millennials because she felt that she said a third of them won't amount to much a third of them will make lots and lots of money and a third of them will change the world because she'd gone down to parkland after the, the shooting she'd gone to charlottesville after the uproar there and she was just into what were these young people going to do to kind of save the world there she was and here she was at the very last week they had a dinner party on saturday night with friends and she and robert apparently cooked and they had a great time they stayed up till midnight the 93 year old and the 83 year old having a wonderful time and then sunday morning she woke up not feeling great and uh just she had her own immune issues like i do you know, we, we took care of sick husbands and then we also had our own health issues. And apparently whatever was her health issue, uh, when she got some infection of something, it went to pneumonia and she died on the Monday. So there she was having a dinner party Sunday, Saturday night. And that makes me so happy that Gail was batting a thousand right before she went. And, and evolving, changing, really, right up until the end, willing to take on new things. Uh, well, those millennials he, just blew me away when I saw them in her house. You know, she, they were all over, but she was working them like slaves. She was saying, you look at this, and you go look at that, and go look at this for me, and would you check out this? You know, and... Uh, and she was, she was doing a podcast, too. She had started that uh, yeah. called Kid Rebels. Uh, you can find it still on the website, gailsheehy.com. In fact, she'd applied, I understand, for a fellowship in audio podcasting at Stony Brook. Uh, listen to those podcasts online. It's, it's just amazing. You, you know, Fred, you bring up an important point. I know that when she and Clay came out to UC Berkeley and they got an apartment with, you know, bookshelves. Yeah, because he was apartment. running the journalism school. Yeah. Right, exactly. And so they were very involved in supporting young talent, supporting young writers. And you know, I love that life lesson of maybe we need to take that class in podcasting. You know, Sherry, I know you just went back and got your degree in, learn. <laughs> in, in, in online journalism. And uh, so... The, the issue, her. Mary, is that she was, she, was, she was teaching others. She had these interns. At the same time, she, she's learning. She's she still, learning from them. Oh, that's what learning. she told me. She said, oh, my gosh, are you kidding? I get back much more than I give to, from these right. kids. Right. And, and that was, she was working with people at Parkland, you know, these young kids who'd been through such trauma uh, in the shooting down there. And, and she said, oh, they're my teachers. Right. I, I think, so this is part of that. Um, what are the different aspects of the third age of life? And Sherry touched on the gener generativity, the thing that matters most, especially now, or time with friends. I've been inspired by how we can have these connections even virtually, that we can come together. I was at an 80th birthday party last week that uh, Ken Dykewell put together, that we, we still have this need to build community wherever we go. And, um, and Fred, we wanted to provide some resources of Gail's work on our yeah. website. And well, her website, Mary, has all of the books there. And mm -hmm. uh, again, uh, you just want to go there. And it's gailsheehe.com. Yeah. Right, gailsheehe.com. You'll find all the books there. Maybe you've read them already. Good time to reread them if, if you have. And right. if you haven't, certainly start reading. It's, it's interesting because we're all looking for great things to read and watch, especially when music and entertainment is not together in the same way. So it seems like a really great time. And we're going to put more information about our new upcoming podcasts on the site, on our site, uh, maryfurlong.com. And then we'll put a link to Gail's podcast, Gail's resources and her site too. So we hope people write to us, right, Fred? And Absolutely. Well, first have. of all, we want to thank CG and Sherry for, for being here with us. This was 
wonderful and couldn't think of anything better for the first edition of this podcast. Thank you, C.G. and Sherry. Well, it was an honor to be invited, and I just le love learning all of your stories, Sherry. <laughs> I know. Well, I have to say, you know, I was thinking about during this whole process that um, Gail it, it gave us a lot of gifts, and she continues to give us gifts. I didn't know C.G. before we started doing this conversation around this, and now I feel like we have a bond with, you know, Gail and our dogs. So, and our dogs. I want to have yeah. one. <laughs> our, ca our Cavaliers, but you know, Gail continues to connect people. And I think that was, again, one of her greatest gifts was the connection that she gave us. So. And also, I honestly think that, you know, she did all this, she said, to, to keep staying, keep like she was staying alive. And she stayed alive until she didn't. And she wanted to be part of the scene and, and give to the scene and learn from the scene. And she'll be in the scene. She's going to be in the scene. Right. go forward and I'm gonna miss her we all yes. miss. I what? also want to Fred uh, point to CG and Sherry's books too so you know we can those who are thinking about learning more about the longevity world we have a lot of great resources we hope to have CG back to talk about how to right size your life a lot I've of done it again by the way so <laughs> right <laughs> <up to date. laughs> And, and Sherry, I know you have a new book in the, in the works, and we also need to follow your Me Time Mondays, which I'm a big fan of. So uh, this is the not the Mickey Mouse Club. It's Fred and Mary here <laughs> with our new podcast, bringing the talent that we can find and the stories that matter as we live longer, better, smarter. Right, Fred? Right, and you... We've got a lot to talk about in future episodes, Mary. The focus is on the intersection of technology, longevity, and aging. Again, you gave it up before, but it's maryfurlong.com. You can also find us on Anchor FM. We'd love to hear from you. Write to us at livinglongerbettersmarter at gmail.com. Thank you for sharing some time with us, and stay safe. <laughs>